so very good morning all so i think uh, some of the participants have been joined it okay uh, very good morning smriti okay so yeah good morning so today uh, uh the first uh, first session that would be 11 to 12 will be handled this is just the preponing of my tomorrow's lecture and tomorrow's slot will be occupied or handled by dr professor halas so i hope uh, now the slides are visible if i am not wrong right yeah just a minute yeah so it is uh, i hope uh, the slides are visible and then the slides are changing would anyone confirm So are the slides changing? Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we will kick start our today's session. So today's session will be on uh, the presence in environment, toxicity towards microbes, and their risk. So uh, previously it has been dealt uh, these topics uh, more or less uh, in the sense that it has been touched upon how their presence is in what. Uh, uh what are the materials that they are available and then especially in uh, uh, yesterday session where professor hada uh, emphasized the different nano materials and their use especially in consumer products medicine uh, electronics uh, healthcare and everything so moving on uh, uh, today's uh, uh, topic would be oriented towards their presence their pathways towards the in the environment and then how they are in a position uh, to uh, get into the environment and stay back into the environment for a longer duration of time and then uh, whether they really possess the uh, risk towards the microorganisms or towards the <coughs> humans is one such question that we will be looking at so nanoparticles in environment so uh, uh, this is one such uh, picture where uh, again uh, Uh, it will communicate that different nanoparticles be it engineered accidental or natural nanoparticles get into the environment and stay back or otherwise react in one or the other form with respect to the other agents so um, the nano products or engineer uh, enm is nothing but the engineer nano materials they are produced for n number of uh, sectors and its application and then they have been used widely in different uh, products such as socks uh, uh, antibacterial properties even in fridges for uh, safeguarding the fruits and then making them fresh without having any uh, microbial contamination as well as incidental as well as industrial release mainly from the suit as i have already said and then what is their pollution or how do they cause pollution and then what happens to their health and safety uh, human health as well as the safety whether handling nanoparticles is really safe enough so in this sense i uh, there are uh, there were yesterday there was also queries that that silver nanoparticles being used what is the concentration of silver ions that whether it is fine but uh, until unless the silver ion concentration doesn't exceed the drinking water limits then it is well fine and good so silver nanoparticles it has been coated onto a surface and then this has been used by the humans and at last again it gets back into one or the other form into the waste water again uh, uh, yesterday we saw that how this silver gets converted or otherwise the silver ion gets released into the water and then they start their work in the water or waste water so upon their presence in uh, waste water or otherwise in the sewer or uh, through the passage they can either converted back as they they can be either retained back as silver nanoparticles based upon their coating yesterday again there was a discussion about the uh, stability of the nanoparticles again if whether they have been coated with respect to the capping agents or else they would be in a position uh, to aggregate start aggregating if aggregation was there then again 
the nanoparticle will be growing bigger in size and then if the if they are very small in size again they will be releasing more and more uh, concentration of silver ion once the silver ion gets released obviously they will start uh, uh, getting or otherwise they uh, react with the ligands that are being present the positively charged negatively charged natural organic matter so assume that if sulfide is being present normally in wastewater treatment not in a wastewater treatment plant but during their passage from the homes to the wastewater treatment plant the pipe connections underground pipe connections where uh, mostly anaerobic uh, conditions prevail without the presence of oxygen so where the sulfide gas even uh, the common practice that in indian uh, uh, people do is that once they want to open or clear any of the blockages that is there in the sewer connection they would be opening the lid and then they will be waiting for some period of time so that all the toxic gases that leaves uh, from the system mostly hydrogen sulfide uh, methane to a certain extent can leave from the sewer otherwise what they used to do is that in order to check whether all the gases have been left off they would be firing a matchstick and then throwing it if, if there are the gases then it will burn or otherwise it won't again in that sense uh, silver uh, 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 silver combining with other ligands so especially sulfide what i was mentioning the anaerobic condition of sulfide is being present this silver ion gets reacted with the sulfide and then it forms silver sulfide and then gets precipitated same goes for silver chloride when you expose silver nanoparticles with uh, especially or otherwise if, if uh, aggregation study has been taken up with respect to silver in uh the ground water especially which is high in chloride content obviously you will be having precipitate at the bottom that is nothing but the silver chloride so again whether the silver transformation happens either in the sewer or in the wastewater treatment plant again those all needs to be looked upon in detail then then it will be easy for us uh, to understand in a big picture so again i uh, said that uh, once it enters the wastewater treatment plant they will be there exactly and then apart from uh, that Uh, there are several agents being added into the water as well as wastewater treatment plant be it the chelating or complex forming agents such as coagulants or otherwise uh, chlorine as such <clears throat> so once uh, these have been added or these nanoparticles which are there in the system what happens in the supernatant as uh, discussed yesterday these natural organic matter can get absorbed onto the surface of the uh, uh, nano materials or nanoparticles and then or else they can get settled at the bottom so one such thing is that they can settle at the bottom uh, and then they can get carried away from the sludge that is one such thing and then this sludge again they can be taken this uh, sludge can uh, also be referred in some of the literatures as uh, biosolids so these solids are being applied on to the field for agricultural activity so once uh, these nanoparticle containing or absorbed sludge Uh, nanoparticles gets on to the sludge uh, and then being applied on to the field and then irrigated and then that water gets into the natural river surface or any uh, any of the water bodies then there is a severe uh, risk of uh, having these pollutants into the food chain so again this uh, the plant can get uptake so either they can have the aggregation or otherwise uptake in their roots again uh, either they can get photo degradation can happen uh in the sense that they can uh, react the metal oxide can react with the sunlight and then they can uh, uh, have uh, ros which we discussed yesterday or else they can also can uh, react or otherwise combine with natural organic matter uh, that is one such thing or release of metal ions from the uh, sludge is also one such thing that will affect the uh, bacteria which are present in the soil so there can be there are chances if that is being uh, allowed to uh, mix with water then there are chances of both ag hetero aggregation as well as homo aggregation but homo aggregation will be very less when when it is applied to soil but again how do they react one one is that they can get aggregated they can be there in the soil or otherwise they can react with a, a microbial population in the soil or they can get carried away in the water and then reach their neighboring uh, river source again Uh, whether uh, it, it all depends upon the state or the nanoparticles, whether it is capped or otherwise, if it is not capped, then again aggregation. If it is capped, again they will be remain stable, and then they can get onto the fish. Yesterday, which Professor Hadas was speaking on. So again, when it reaches the water uh, system, again there are several factors that comes into picture because the pH of the water changes and then everything, everything. So this picture, in short, gives us the clear picture of what happens when. two different nanoparticles because there are several products which keeps uh, which has been used in the consumer uh, goods uh, day in and day out 
and then when that is the case these can get as a combined uh, so one or two more different nanoparticles they can get combined and then they can uh, behave in in a different way when compared to the individual nanoparticle so uh, in the lab if being analyzed the individual nanoparticle will behave towards a specific set of organisms in a different way but when when they are there in the mixture or uh, with the other nanoparticles they combine and then they form it in a, they react in a different manner so again this is one such thing then at last it ends uh, everywhere with respect to the human exposure whether uh, exposed to concentration of these nanoparticles in one or the other form does it reaches the food chain so on to the top as a, 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 as spoken earlier the commonly used nanoparticles are silver followed by uh, carbon nanotubes followed by metal and metal oxide nanoparticles and then one such study uh, has quantified the concentration of these uh, metal oxide nanoparticles especially in a wastewater treatment plant and then the, at the influent as uh, as again in the yesterday's discussion what is how how to quantify their concentration again convert back into uh, mostly the uh, concentration will be uh, expressed in terms of microgram per liter you digest the sample and then analyze to aas or icp so it was found that 615 plus or minus 530 again it is uh, still in microgram level but at the same time at the effluent side at the influent is very high and then the effluent is very low uh, but again the silver the effluent concentration is very pretty low but still uh, what uh, what happens when this gets accumulated in the environment is one such thing there, there, there is a term called bioaccumulation whether they keep accumulating onto the species and then at last it creates a problem so uh, as it is uh, once it reaches the water waste water again all these are heterogeneous mixture and then it is a complex medium in which uh, uh, in order to uh, specifically or pinpoint the the one single standout mechanism will be very difficult so again as it it is very complex so uh, it is very difficult but I, again at the same time uh, large scale experiments will guide us to uh, basically understand how do they how will they behave in the environment so Uh, toxicity of these nanoparticles again it depends upon uh, how it has been exposed to whether it has been ingested through food inhaled or absorbed onto the body so again if incorporated into any other organisms it may also enter the food chain so this is one such thing that uh, we have been looking uh, as that these nanoparticles when that they are sludge applied onto the fields uh, uh, crops have been grown or food materials have been grown and then what happens when it gets into the life cycle regulations has not been established for labeling all the nanoparticles so this is one such challenge again are these nanoparticles are really a contaminant do is it needs to be worried about uh, but still uh, us epa across the world researchers are working in order to know the significant toxic pathways as well as their effect on to different organs so once that is available well enough then it will be easy for otherwise the policy makers as well as the regulatory authorities to call upon this as the pollutant and then move on and then uh, health uh, health concerns uh, one such thing is that accumulation of uh, these nanoparticles on to any of the tissues so one such uh, example where we can uh, highlight is about the nanoparticles getting attached on to the surface of the fish or uh, or any other microbial mass that is available in water or else the waste water so this uh, toxicity mechanism so once they get on to the board they can either release uh, dissolution can happen aggregation can happen uh, uh, photocatalytic action can also uh, initiate based upon the scenario based upon the medium in which it is being suspended so as uh, this again it is so in a simplistic manner uh, it is uh, been communicated that what would be the case of these nanoparticles when are they when is there in the sludge again when it comes to the wastewater treatment plant supernatant and uh, sludge that is one such big thing and then the water when it comes to the supernatant once it gets away with the regulations that that it can be let out into the inland water bodies what happens when the crop is irrigated again the sludge when it is being used as a manure what happens to it at last does it is there any chance of this coming into the food and then what happens when a specific individual be it the child or otherwise an adult consumes the uh, food which is being contaminated uh, <clears throat> it can be easily correlated that uh, in newspaper there would be uh, case studies where uh, reports would be available that uh, 
the spinach or otherwise the radish or beetroot which has been cultivated onto the banks of a river has high concentration of these metals uh, because of this absorption onto the food material so again uh, this is one such thing that needs to be looked upon and then once such attempt has been done so let us discuss uh, that so nanoparticles in wastewater it is uh, not only the same uh, uh, thing which has been um, quantified uh, or otherwise the researchers are eager to know what is their concentration in their uh, uh, concentration in the environment so several attempts have been made in order to uh, divide the wastewater treatment plant into two, two three segments that is uh, the primary segments or otherwise the influent segment effluent at the treatment so the uh, one such study where they want they they were eager to quantify and then they looked upon the size range of the nanoparticle was something between 200 or otherwise between 300 to 400 so in this size range so zno is nothing but the nanoparticle that we are looking into xm is nothing xm and xh is nothing but the location of the wastewater treatment plant so two different wastewater treatment plants and then when they looked upon with respect to the time how do they behave so whether they keep aggregating whether the size of the nanoparticles keeps increasing and then they found up to a certain time that the nanoparticles range was something around between 200 to 400 so and then when 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 uh, when uh, looked upon inside the uh, uh, image or in sludge it has been also noted that these nanoparticles are there as as a proof that they are there in the sludge as well so uh, several attempts have been made whether the treatment units that are there or otherwise the treatment processes that are there in the wastewater treatment plant say it is aerobic or anaerobic in aerobic there are extended aeration activity sludge process conventional sludge process membrane treatment filters membrane filtration and then in a combination of different unit processes are in place so there are attempts to determine these effect on to the nanoparticle or on to the performance of the wastewater treatment plant so one such attempt has been made and then it was understood that while what is the percentage of removal of these nanomaterials particles uh, from uh, based upon the uh, uh, treatment that is being happened so interestingly it was uh, one such study uh, as 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 discussed earlier they segmented different stages of based water treatment plan and then uh, the researchers were more uh, interested uh, in arriving at the concentration of not one single nanoparticle but different nanoparticles which are there in the wastewater treatment plant so they categorized as influent effluent uh, influent and effluent as well as at the sludge and what is the case after primary after the treatment that is secondary treatment after tertiary treatment it was found that at a certain level see assume that at the secondary effluent the concentration of these metal metal particle metal ions was not uh, or, or it was reduced when it compared to the influent level so that is one such thing that treatment process removes these nanoparticles which are there in solution to a certain extent but again what happens when these nanoparticles are there uh, get got into the sludge so again Uh, again when it comes after treatment and uh, the water that is being left out there is a significant change or very slight change that can be observed but at the when it comes to uh, the sludge that is being taken out uh, from each and every stage it was found that the concentration of these nano materials or nanoparticles were very high uh, and then it, it 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 conveys the meaning that these nanoparticles uh, gets into the sludge and then that is a major concern to be looked into <clears throat> so when they are there in sludge what happens so when these nanoparticles gets into sludge so assume that this is an activated sludge and then this is nothing but the zinc oxide and then the, how does the sludge behave with respect to a nanomaterial so whether what happens uh, to them whether they react that is one such thing of what concentration they can react so assume that in this study they looked upon what is their impact of these nanoparticles not only on the treatment performance but also uh, on the nutrient removal that is nothing but the nitrogen and phosphorus nitrogen and phosphorus are one such there are several techniques to remove them uh, from the wastewater and then uh, what is the role whether they uh, enhance the removal efficiency of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus or they reduce the efficiency of this two 
nutrients. So when when looked upon uh, these two things, it was uh, exposed. Uh, this study looked into two different concentration. That is nothing but 10 and 50 milligram per liter of zinc oxide nanoparticles. And then they exposed and then they evaluated the performance onto the removal efficiency of both nutrient and phosphorus. And then it was observed that these 10 and 50 milligram per liter of zinc oxide nanoparticles could able to uh, decrease the removal efficiency. That means that they affect the uh, conversion or otherwise the reduction of nitrogen and phosphorus to the end product. And then they interfere in that process. So one such thing, it can be again, uh, when, when we, uh, in the yesterday's lecture, again, we saw upon the mechanisms of in which how these nanoparticles gets onto the cell wall, uh, ROS formation, rupture the cell wall, and then interact with the uh, membranes and everything. And then, <clears throat> uh, when looked upon, it was uh, found that uh, inhibition of nitrogen as well as phosphorus removal induced by higher concentration, that is nothing but 50 milligram per liter, was due to the release of zinc ions. So as we discussed yesterday, these nanoparticles keep releasing ions into the solution. And that is one such major thing that interacts or otherwise that decides the fate of removal efficiency of any certain thing in the water, wastewater. And then uh, due to the release of this zinc, zinc ions, dissolution and increase of reactive oxygen species happens. And then because of these, they keep interfering with all the uh, uh, enzymes that is there with the sludge. So again, this is one such mechanism or otherwise one such pathway in which they interfere so that uh, the conversion or otherwise the reduction of nutrient uh, such as nitrogen and phosphorus doesn't happen in the treatment system. So if because of this presence, uh, everything would look fine. And then if, if there is no such idea that these nanoparticles interfere in this, the in influent concentration and then the effluent concentration of these nutrients will be more or less the same. In that case, what, what happens? What, what is the case? So in that case, uh, the regulatory authority as well as the plant official will have no clue what is the uh, thing that goes uh, wrong in the uh, treat, uh, treatment system. So uh, these emerging pollutants have a vital role in reducing these efficiency, especially or by interfering in the process of production. So uh, moving on, uh, this is one such study that was carried out by myself, where uh, we explored or otherwise uh, we looked into what happens uh, with the, uh, the metal oxide nanoparticles when it is being exposed to the sludge. Uh, two different nanoparticles were uh, took, and then that is nothing but silver uh, oxide and titanium dioxide, and then the mixture of uh, these two were uh, also looked into. So because the wastewater doesn't have any single nanoparticle coming into the stream. So in that case, two different concentration, one and 10 milligram per liter, these are the realistic concentration in the sludge, for the uh, realistic concentration that you can be able to arrive at the uh, uh, interference of these nanoparticle into any uh, uh, parameters that you are about to look on. When, when uh, exposed to these nanoparticles over a period of time, say assume that 90 days, it was exposed to 180 days and uh, uh, these nanoparticles started reflecting uh, uh, their performance with respect to the reduction in COD as well as BOD. Apart from that, they also started getting precipitated at the bottom and then when looked upon uh, under the uh, uh, transmission electron microscope, they were able to found successfully in the sludge. So that means that these nanoparticles gets onto the sludge and then they get accumulated onto the sludge. So this was uh, one such a uh, temp analysis where at 200 nanometer scale, these nanoparticles were able to be found onto the sludge. And then it was also found that uh, when it com compared, uh, when it when the EDS uh, was also analyzed, it was found that uh, titanium was more uh, uh, in the sludge than the silver. Again, uh, silver, due to the release of silver ion, silver chloride was also precipitated, that white color precipitate, which could be able to visually see it. And then when it compared to the sludge, titanium concentration was predominant compared to the silver ion concentration. Uh, with respect to the uh, performance of the reactors, lab scale reactors, uh, COD reduction was mainly, uh, mainly the additive effort or otherwise the mixture was outperforming. The mixture of uh, both the metal oxide nanoparticle was outperforming the individual uh, effect of these nanoparticle onto the system performance. An antagonistic effect was observed. That means that uh, the combination of two different nanoparticle outperformed the uh, 
uh, were more enough when compared to the mixture of nanoparticles which is there uh, in the system. So uh, it was uh, well proven that these nanoparticles interfere uh, in the reduction of pollutants or otherwise in the treatment of wastewater. <clears throat> so moving on, uh, when it comes uh, when it compares when it comes to the sludge. So again, uh, in the, in our study, we looked upon the nanoparticle concentration in the supernatant as well as in the sludge. The concentration of the silver as well as titanium was again it was there in the microgram per liter range for initial days, but again it was getting accumulated over the period of time. So as the sludge is being as it was an activated system and then the sludge was kept on being removed, the more and more concentration of the nanoparticle was found to be there in the sludge. And then the uh, mechanism or the pathways in which they can get onto the sludge is one such thing is adsorption, which was already looked upon how these particles gets adsorbed onto the surface. Uh, entrapment, uh, these nanoparticles can get entrapped between the sludge or onto the sludge. And aggregation or otherwise, uh, compaction and degradation can also happen. Some of the nanoparticles can over the period of time can get degraded, degraded and uh, reactivity. So again, reactive oxidation species and mobility in any other environmental compartment when being applied onto uh, different media such as soil, sludge or otherwise any other environmental contaminant, they can get uh, settled over the period of time there. So this is one such study, again, uh, one such evidence where uh, it has been proven that these nanoparticles uh, uh, can get otherwise gets retained onto the sludge. So that is uh, this is once a study uh, where uh, they exposed a cerium dioxide, uh, cerium oxide nanoparticles to uh, the wastewater treatment plant, and then it was uh, found that these nanoparticles gets absorbed or otherwise gets entrapped between in the sludge. So this is of uh, one such evidence that then nanoparticles can get in uh, can get into the sludge and then which is of a uh, real concern to determine the toxic levels of these when applied onto the agriculture <clears throat> so uh, in our lab again uh, it was also been uh, explored uh, with respect to the nanomaterial or nanoparticle exposure assessment to the plants so what happens to the germination so prepare a solution and then expose the seeds to those solution in a petri dish and then check what is their uh, root and shoot length and then that will help uh, in the initial stage to understand whether these nanoparticles has any specific uh, uh, impact onto the germination of seeds. So before going or otherwise before doing a big study with, uh, rather than expose, expo, exposing these nanoparticles to the sludge or in as a, a liquid media. So this was uh, being germinated and then exposed to the nanoparticle, nanoparticles and then control is nothing but without exposure and then 10 is nothing but the concentration of copper oxide, 100 again the concentration, 1000 is nothing but the concentration. So if if, if there is a comparison again if, if, if it can be compared that means that these nanoparticles at a higher concentration stop the uh, growth of the particular seed that we have uh, took into consideration. <clears throat> so again, this plays, this comes into the picture of uh, uptake of these nanoparticles until unless uh, if it is done, the reduction of the growth of that particular seed will not happen. So moving on, uh, one such uh, another study as we had discussed in previous uh, sessions as well, one such study was also being done in, in such a way that the spinach was uh, exposed to nanoparticles. Uh, in, the, in the previous thing, the nanoparticles was there in the solution and then the seeds were germinated with the nanoparticle solution. But in this case, the nanoparticles were exposed uh, with the sludge that has been taken from a local treatment plant. And then it was uh, <clears throat> assumed that the uh, sludge didn't have any of the nanoparticles before pressed, uh, before being applied to the uh, soil and then once applied these nanoparticles of different concentration were taken into picture and then what happens over the period of time uh, and then the uptake of uh, nanoparticles in the edible parts with the leaves the shoot as well as the root were analyzed and then the human health risk assessment a small task was uh, calculated what what happens when you consume this uh, 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 leaf in at least uh, in at least one one go of your meat. So what is the 
uh, a risk that has already we had seen about the uh, in ingestion, inhalation, and absorption as one such pathways uh, of these nanoparticle. So again, this this will be discussed in detail. What happens to this? Uh, whether the humans are really in risk when 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 it is being exposed to uh, where the plants are being cultivated with the nanoparticles contaminated or otherwise nanoparticle containing sludge. And then uh, this is one such uh, one more study. Uh, I think uh, this this can also. Uh, uh, be clear that the nanoparticle interferes in the growth of uh, the cell growth. Normally, in yesterday's uh, session was also discussed in the morning as well as the afternoon, where these nanoparticles starts interfering onto the cell wall, and then at a uh, later time they uh, keep uh, establishing themselves inside the cell, and then at last uh, there is no growth for that cell to happen. So. Um, the pathways of uh, the nanoparticles inside the cell, it was already discussed, so I'll be moving on. Uh, toxicity assessment, uh, how to assess the toxicity? Again, how to assess the, uh, uh, whether they, are they really toxic enough to the humans? And then in order to do, do that, a risk assessment was initially carried upon. So as I have said that, uh, what happens? Otherwise, what happens once you take a meal or uh, once you uh, once uh, this nanoparticle containing sludge or uh, cultivated sludge plant cultivated with the nanoparticle containing uh, sludge is being used. So one such study has been done uh, <clears throat> where uh, risk assessment was done. One such a risk assessment is a health based risk as well as ecological risk, which is a health based risk for the humans and then ecological risk for the total aquatic species, uh, physical environment and as such. So when it comes to ecological risk, uh, one such thing is that we can be it can be exposed to uh, different uh, fish types, or especially the small fishes, and then how are the base the larvae, uh, and then how do they perform? Uh, how do they react uh, in terms of a different environment? So in this case, when when we looked upon or the when in this study, they looked upon the embryo of the zebra fish, and then uh, the nanoparticles was found to be onto the top of uh, the skin that is onto the larva. So uh, we uh, in our study, we are not interested about uh, this ecological risk, but uh, we were more concerned about the health risk that is it is more uh, towards the human. So in order to carry out a risk assessment, uh, you need to have a source, a medium and receptor. Source is nothing but uh, the nanoparticle itself as a source, which is there in the environment and then medium, how it is being transported uh, to the uh, receptor. Receptor is nothing but the humans and then how it is being through air or through water or through food. So again, uh, this was nothing but the medium and source is nothing but where it comes from. Either it comes from a product, it comes from the food material which is being coated with nanoparticles or it comes from the one or the other form. So water, it is nothing but the ingestion route. Say assume that the uh, water that you drink contains nanoparticles. Air is nothing but the inhalation and then it gets onto the lungs. Soil is again the ingestion route where you cultivate the soil containing nanoparticles and then you take upon and food is nothing but the, again the ingestion route you consume the food so uh, there there are some basic terminologies where uh, background and incremental and total risk background is nothing but the uh, risk what people are exposed uh, to from a given medium what is the risk that the people exposed will get from the given medium be it the air water and soil incremental uh, uh, risk is nothing but because of the presence of this pollutant in this environment, what is the risk that gets uh, along with the medium? So the risk due to addition of an external pollutant or extra pollutant or otherwise emerging pollutant in the medium, whatever the medium that we are looking concerned of, whether it can be water, air or soil or occurrence of any event. It can be of uh, a volcanic ash or oil spill or uh, uh, incidental increase uh, left over into a neighboring uh, water source. So it can be of anything. So total risk is nothing but uh, the combination or summation of background as well as uh, the incremental risk. Acceptable risk, what is acceptable? So this is the total risk that you have. What is the acceptable risk? This is uh, nothing but the allowable risk particular to, uh, particular to the contaminant uh, and then it can uh, result in or from any receptor. So risk ratio is nothing but R total. So that is nothing but the combination of both the background as well as incremental risk divided by R acceptable. If this value is less than one, then it is of no concern. And then if this value, the total or the risk ratio is greater than one. So one, 
is nothing but the integer and then if it is greater than 1 obviously then the product or the material which is of the material that has been uh, undergone the study is a really a matter of concern so that means that it possesses a risk towards the uh, humans uh, especially in the medium that has been taken <clears throat> so uh, in order to uh, make us understand so let us have a simple uh, uh, problem where uh, assume that in us a lifetime risk of getting cancer is 1 to the 10 power minus 6 so this is nothing but the acceptable risk so it, this is in a lifetime so you have a probability and then in that probability 1 into 10 power minus 6 and then the background risk of getting cancer is say about 10 power minus 5 so again uh, when what will be the total risk and then what will be the risk ratio so in here if you combine this uh, background as well as the acceptable risk so it is nothing but 1.1 into 10 power minus 5 and then in order to know what is the risk whether it is a matter of concern so it is nothing but 1.1 that is nothing but the acceptable risk divided by the total risk so our acceptable risk is nothing but 10 power minus 6 divided by 1.1 into 10 power uh, divided by uh, what to say uh, the total risk so here if you do that then it will be like the total uh, risk will be greater than 1 in that sense it is of a matter of concern so that means that the chances uh, very the chances are very high that you will be exposed otherwise you will be uh, getting cancer <clears throat> so in that case uh, moving on uh, this again i will be coming back uh, there will be uh, one more uh, example from a lab where we can discuss about that and then we can be able to correlate uh, before going into that so acceptable daily intake so that is uh, adi in some of the re reference articles they will be uh, uh, communicating that reference concentration in water that is nothing but either it can be in soil it can be in air it can be in water so assume that it be in water into water ingestion rate that is nothing but how much it is being consumed per day assume that uh, on average if it is 2.5 to 3 liters so assume that it is 3 liters per day and what is the concentration in that 3 liters so again milligram per liter or microgram per liter or acceptable daily uh, intake is nothing but reference concentration in air and then whichever the medium that we are looking upon either it can be water air or soil uh, into air inhalation rate so it is nothing but how, how much amount of time that you know, we consume upon so it can be if it is water it is nothing but the concentration in water and then if it is there in air the units one alone will change so uh, when it comes to risk assessment there are uh, several steps uh, one such thing is that hazard identification followed by exposure assessment and uh, dose, dose response, exposure assessment and risk characterization. So hazard identification is nothing but uh, defining an hazard and then uh, if you have a doubt that whether it, it, it has a harmless, it can create harmless to you. So that let us have, as a, have an assumption that these nanoparticles are an hazard to the uh, human health. An exposure assessment and determination of concentration in environment. What is their concentration in water? What is their concentration in sludge or in soil? And estimation of ingestion as well as inhalation rate of that contaminant in that specific medium of concern. So if it is a medium of concern in water, so arrive at the concentration in water, or if it is in air, arrive at the concentration in air. Dose response, so again, as the name itself suggests that you vary the dose and then uh, you get the response and then assess it. So that is nothing but the dose response. And risk characterization. So here you arrive at and then you assess the risk whether again uh, you uh, arrive at the values and then uh, uh, communicate to the audience that whether it, it really has a uh, threat or a potential impact on the environment. So moving on. Uh, so again, I will be here uh, now if you could be able to uh, visualize it. So nanoparticles uh, are there in different products and then leaching of nanoparticles happens uh, or <coughs> sorry, these nanoparticles gets into the sludge. What happens when this sludge is being applied onto the plant and then really what happens is the plant gets uptake, uh, whether they really uptake these uh, uh, metal uh, oxide nanoparticles into it and then what happens to the humans when they consume and then uh, it is being uh, correlated or conveyed in terms of the dietary intake estimation with respect to a child and as well as adult, a child as well as an adult, what, what is the quantity in which the 
uh, concentration that has been taken by the adult and then the quantity that has been taken by the uh, uh, child. And then if the dietary intake is greater than that of reference dose, so obviously there is a health risk and then we will be looking with respect to a pop. So again, uh, this is one such picture. Again, it will uh, 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 explain or otherwise it will make us understand that uh, what is their pathways into the environment, whether whether these nanoparticles again, if they release, what happened when dissolution happens again, these ions, whether they will be uh, taken up or otherwise retained in the root or otherwise in the shoot or otherwise it will be there onto the leaf. So in this thing, uh, one such assessment was done where uh, dietary intake is nothing but uh, one is the metal concentration that it can be uh, as this was into the media of spinach, the soil, uh, as well as uh, it has been expressed in terms of milligram per kilogram of fresh weight. So what is the amount of spinach leaves that has been taken for the food to get it consumed? B is nothing but the intake per serving. And then uh, C represents the number of serving. If it has been taken thrice a day, then again it is thrice. And D represents the body weight because the uh, body weight of a child as well as the adult will be different. So in this case, two different, uh, three different nanoparticles were exposed. That, that nothing but silver as well as titanium, silver oxides, so titanium dioxide, and uh, a mixture of these two. And then <clears throat> it was uh, found that uh, interestingly, the mixture had a greater effect uh, on to the uh, age group of less than 50, uh, whereas uh, after age group of 50, they didn't, uh, they were very well less than that of the reference dose. This reference dose can be taken from uh, one such website that is IRIS, Information uh, for Risk Assessment, and then where you can able to get the reference dose. And then for silver, it was again, for all the age groups, uh, starting from the child to adult, they had a, a significant impact. They possess a significant risk towards the humans as well as the child. But th that was the same case for titanium uh, when the mixture of nanoparticles had a severe impact onto the uh, child. But again, when it comes to titanium as a single entity, when it is being present as a single uh, one thing, uh, it outperforms the mixture and then possesses a severe uh, risk towards the child as well as the uh, uh, humans, or otherwise the adult, when these are being taken into, or otherwise these are being uh, consumed uh, uh, when it is being contaminated, when it is being uptaken in the food chain. So uh, uh, coming back, uh, whether are these questions are answered? So uh, whether are these being, uh, as we all know that how complex is the wastewater treatment system and then what is the chance of these being taken up into the roots and then again, the chance of getting it into the food again, uh, but still it is a complex network of uh, chain of events where uh, it is being really difficult to understand uh, what is the long-term impact of uh, these nanoparticles onto the treatment system as, uh, as such, whether it reduces the nitrogen and phosphorus removal efficiency. But again, as it is uh, aerobic system, again, you, we are looking about the only the reduction in COD, BOD, but again, when it comes to anaerobic setup, what happens to the gas generation? Uh, whether are these nanoparticles really settled at the bottom of the anaerobic setup or do they really interfere in the gas generation because the efficiency of the anaerobic will be gauged upon uh, how much amount of gas and then what is the volume reduction that has happened with respect to the sludge again so are these ch challenges are really addressed though the pathways have been clearly dictated or otherwise now uh, it is at least the concentration as well as the pathways are very clear uh, uh, to the scientific divine but still uh, their mechanism in wastewater, the mechanism in water, their uptake as well as their toxicity towards the humans or otherwise the risk, uh, assessing the risk towards the human of consuming these nanoparticle containing uh, food as well as materials is really a, a major con concern and then still more and more uh, study or uh, uh, focus needs to be done, especially total life cycle of these nanoparticles where once it enters the environment. So until unless that is being uh, uh, done on a, <clears throat> uh, a macro scale, it will be very difficult uh, for, uh, it will be a very challenging task to uh, tie the knot and then come up with a one single uh, solution. So <clears throat> again, uh, in, in yesterday's uh, class, we also saw about whether these nanoparticles, when they are there in the water, do they possess a severe risk? So where is the source of these nanoparticles coming from? As, uh, as projected here, these nanoparticles, once it is being left, or otherwise gets escaped uh, from the supernatant, or otherwise escapes from the treatment system, uh, which is there in place, 
so again uh, these can create uh, a, a really uh, these can possess a severe risk towards or otherwise a, a threat to the humans because once it is being taken up it, it can possess a severe uh, health impacts onto the humans which is still a, a major area of concern which needs to be looked at so so with this uh, i stop for uh, today's session uh, if uh, any uh, clarifications or any questions are there then feel free to let us discuss now <clears throat> yeah Yeah, uh, if any questions are there, uh, do drop in uh, the chat box, otherwise you can let me know. Okay, so if there are no questions, so uh, we can uh, uh, wind up. The session and then um, uh, in the afternoon we will be having uh, Professor Hadas where uh, she will be taking us uh, to the applications of nanomaterials in different uh, streams <clears throat> and then uh, let us all meet at 2.25 exactly not on time so that uh, the session will start at 2.30. Okay so thank you all for joining so let us meet at 2.30. Uh, 225 sorry